So, hi everybody, my name is David Bethel. I'm a third year student ODP at Edge Hill University. Um, and that's what qualifies me to talk to you today about uh, operating department practice. It's probably good for aspiring students to speak to a student as well. So if you've got any questions, pop them in the side and I'll try and get around to answering them at some point through this session. So, ODPs, where do we fit in with the allied health profession? So I think it was about 2015, we were um, recognised as an allied health profession and we work within the NHS. We're registered healthcare professions with the Health and Cares Professions Council. And um, to register as an ODP, you need to complete um, an approved course through a higher education institution. And once you complete that course, you get your you apply for your registration. Once approved, you are then allowed to use the title of operating department practitioner. This is protected in law, and only those that are registered can use that title. So currently, as it stands, there are approximately 14,000 registered ODPs uh, within the UK. And uh, at the moment, to help with the uh, current coronavirus pandemic, they opened a temporary register and there are over 800 um, registered members on the temporary register. And they come from a variety of backgrounds. Um, for example, some of them have returned to practice to help out with the uh, current staffing issues. And a lot of them are made up from um, third year students that have finished all their clinical placements and they've been eligible to apply for temporary registration until they're eligible to apply for full registration. So it just helps uh, bridge the gap in some uh, current workforce issues. So who are we? Who are the operating department practitioners? So we're often referred to as the secret weapon of the, SA, uh, of the NHS some people call us the SAF, SAS of the NHS. And that is because our role is primarily behind the closed doors of the operating theatre, hence the title Operating Department Practitioner. So we're not really seen in the general um, hospital unless you're coming in for a procedure. So what we are is we're highly skilled and knowledgeable professionals and we are integral members of the uh, theatre team. We advocate for patients during the surgical procedures, which is you know, one of the patients most vulnerable time of their lives. So this is referred to as a perioperative journey. So this is broken down into three phases for the patient. So ODPs work autonomously in each of these phases and we use evidence-based practice to carry out our role. So each of these phases, I'll, I'll discuss them briefly now. So we've got the anaesthetic phase, which is generally the pre-surgical phase when a patient is put to sleep. Uh, in that role, we'll work alongside an anaesthetist to help anaesthetize the patient. Then the patient goes on to the next stage of the perioperative journey, which is the surgical phase. So from the anaesthetic room into the operating theater where the, the surgery is carried out, ODPs are trained to work alongside surgeons. And what we'll do, Predominantly, we will um, prepare the equipment, make sure there's a sterile field, and we'll maintain that sterile field whilst advocating for the patient. So at the end of the surgery, the patient, because they've been anaesthetized, they have to be cared for in a specific area called the post-anesthetic care unit. ODPs are trained to work in this environment, um, generally due to our airway skills and uh, anesthetic knowledge. And we will help patients go from uh, waking up from their operation until they're in a state ready to go back to a ward. And we will care for them throughout that phase. So what I'm going to show you here is a visual representation of briefly what I've just discussed. And it might help explain things a little more clearly when you can see it working. So I'm going to leave you for two minutes to watch this video. ODPs are a key member of the team. You need to be able to react to difficult situations, have a really close eye on the patient, who is the number one priority. My main aim is to provide patient safety and welfare. On a normal working day, I'm based as an aesthetic ODP, so I'll be working most of the time with nurses and anesthetists, but you can work in accident and emergency, intensive care unit, surgery and recovery. 
Normally, your patient comes in really shy, scared at the same time. So, we talk about their favorite subjects at school, favorite three they're gonna have, just to distract them. I want them to feel comfortable. When the patient's asleep, we go straight in the theater, I transfer the patient into the operating table, and perform the procedure. I need to assist the anesthetist and basically maintain patient safety. But if you're an ODP on the scrub side, you'll be assisting the surgeon, so you'll be more fast instruments to the surgeon. They have to count the instrument to make sure that there's no instrument left inside the patient. As an ODP, I think you have to be compassionate, um, hardworking, dedicated, respectful, and able to work in multidisciplinarity. The best bit of my job is um, knowing that the patients are all fine and okay by the end of the procedure. It was nice because before he was distracting me when they were putting needles in my hand. Um, I knew who he was afterwards when I was really tired, which was nice. ODP job is very rewarding. Being appreciated by my team members, the parents and the patients themselves is very fulfilling. So following on from that, um, at the end of towards the end of that video, uh, the ODP they named some uh, key attributes towards um, you know considering things that you, you need to have within yourself to consider being an ODP. So I'm just going to list a few that I think that are very important um, from from a personal perspective to, to consider uh, wanting to become uh, part of the operating team. So ones that I've listed are you need to be caring compassionate, empathetic, you need to be honest and trustworthy, you need to be very diligent, you need to be a team player, you need good communication skills or excellent communication, so communication skills I will add, um, problem solving skills and organisational skills. When you're working in such a dynamic environment, you're meeting patients from all your early years of life, so from being born to at the end stage of life, everybody um, might need some surgical intervention at any time. So important skills are to be uh, are to be able to communicate effectively, and that not only transcribes from patients, but also between your uh, interprofessional team within the theatre. So you're working alongside uh, surgeons, anaesthetists, nursing staff, uh, radiographers. Um, healthcare assistants, and there are other people within the theatre that might come in from time to time. So, you know, these are some fundamental skills that you need to consider uh, whether you have. But there are also skills that you can develop throughout your training. So I'm just going to start to explain now how, how would you become an ODP. So to become an ODP, you need to um, embark on an approved uh, course, which is usually a higher education institution. And this will take form in either a degree, a Bachelor of Science degree, or a diploma, higher education diploma. And that is obviously in operating department practice. Um, a list of these universities can be found on the NHS Careers Course Finder website, which I will put in the link in the chat section and on the UCAS website. And recently, um, in the last couple of years, an alternative route was um, created for people to get into operating department practice and this was through a degree apprenticeship. Uh, this is not a direct entry um, route like the, uh, the the diploma or the degree. This is uh, usually done through a trust uh, so the, these vacancies used as advertised by a trust or on the NHS apprenticeship website. So this, if you go on the NHS careers Finder, this is uh, the type of screen that you're going to come up and uh, discover. So just type in the uh, leading to a career in operating department practice, full time, part time and pick a region that you're looking in. And then what will happen is on your screen, it'll pop up with a list of universities in that region that, you're, that are offering the, the, the program. The alternative one, like I said, was the um, UCAS website. This is similar to the NHS careers website. 
but it just gives you uh, information uh, that may not be contained on the NHS careers website. And once you've found a university that you might be interested in, have a look on their website and this will tell you more course specific information uh, in relation to the course that they offer. It'll tell you more specific entry requirements. It'll tell you more specific um, course, course um, structure in detail in terms of what you're doing year one, year two, year three, and so on. And it'll also give you contact details for um, staff in the department if you wish to speak to anybody about uh, applying. So uh, I'm going to talk now about uh, admissions and entry requirements. This is typical. Um, like I've explained, just if you if you got any questions about entry, um, speak to the particular university that you're interested in joining, and they will give you the um, specific entry requirements. But typically, you're looking at five GCSEs at grades A to C or four to nine in the new way of marking things. And this generally includes mathematics, English, and a physical science, which is uh, biology, chemistry, or physics. 112 UCAS points, which should typically include a physical science, or again, biology, uh, biology chemistry, or physics. Evidence of recent study or engagement in personal or professional development. Um, that's probably more difficult if you're a mature student. Um, so speak to your university and ask them what sort of uh, evidence they'll be looking at. It might be that they want you to go on an access course or do something that um, they require through their university to do. And I know some examples where they will ask you to write uh, an essay, a, a practice essay and they will assess that to see if um, you meet their standards. But again, it's it's specific to each university. And then following on from the academic requirements, you need to uh, meet the occupational health requirements of the programme. Again, further information of this can be found from the university. But um, obviously, given the environment that you're going to work in, there are um, certain protections or precautions that need to be made in terms of protecting patients, but also for protecting you as well from potentially harmful um, things that you can come into contact with within the operating theatre. And uh, one last safety um, issue is you need to get uh, clearance from uh, the Disclosure and Barrier Service, DBS, or Disclosure Scotland, and this is usually at the enhanced level. This is just to check that you're in good character. Right, so you've applied for your course. You're doing well on the course. You're settling into your, your new roles and you're the qualified ODP. And then you think, what am I going to do myself now? So I'm going to just briefly talk about some uh, career opportunities. This isn't, a, this isn't a definitive list. There are more things out there. But um, just to demonstrate that there are progression routes that you can go into once you're a qualified ODP and registered ODP. So you can always stay in anaesthetics, surgery or PACU, post-anaesthetic care unit. You can have a wonderful career doing that with a variety and um, the dynam uh, variety of the job, sorry. Um, no day is the same. Every patient's different, no matter if they're coming in for the same procedure, every patient has got their own background, their own medical history, which changes the dynamics of how they're cared for. So it's not a job that you're going to get bored in. There's plenty of change. Um, you can work in critical care or the emergency department. So recently, with the coronavirus outbreak, there's been a lot of ODPs going working over on the intensive care units. And this is because of our uh, our airway skills, airway management skills, and our anaesthetic knowledge. Um, this has opened up a lot more routes into um, this sort of role because we've been recognised as having appropriate skills and knowledge and experience, uh, which can be transferred into you know a critical care unit. You can go to education. Now you might think education, college, higher education institute to teach ODPs, but not also that. But not just that, you can also go and teach in an NHS trust. You can be a clinical educator, which is an in-house training department, which um, will train its own staff to whatever 
uh, things they need, like uh, basic life support, advanced life support, intermediate life support, and so on. You can go into leadership and management. You've got the clinical side of it and the non-clinical side of it. I know of um, ODPs that have gone into uh, become deans of uh, faculties and universities, um, gone quite high up in the health education in England. And again, it all stems from having and acquiring the skills that you've got as an ODP. Research and health informatics. Uh, this is probably not as prevalent as some other professions in terms of uh, ODPs getting into this side of things. However, ODPs, uh, you do research within your, um, your training and you are expected to use evidence-based practice to uh, carry out your role. So you will have an understanding of how research works and how to interpret research. So you have fundamental skills that can be transferred into having a, a career as a researcher or health informatics as well. So we've got anaesthesia, anaesthesia associate. So this is um, a profession that is similar to an anaesthetist, um, but it's it's restricted in terms of the um, how sick patients are in the level of um, responsibility that you get in looking after patients. Um, but it is more advanced than the uh, an ODP in general. So you look you look more after the induction of anaesthesia side of things rather than the assisting side of things. Surgical care practitioner. Um, I met one of these when I was um, newly qualified. Uh, not newly qualified. When I first started my training, and I was um, observing an organ retrieval process for organ donation, and the scrub practitioner was a surgical care practitioner. However, she was an ODP and this opened my eyes into where an ODP can go to in, in, in terms of their career because that's an extremely specialist role. And they can go to advanced clinical practice, the skills that you get, the uh, anatomic, anatomy and physiology skills that you acquire um, and the other fundamental skills that you need to do your job is a good foundation to be able to to go into advanced clinical practice. Um, there are a lot of routes. Um, you can go and work in GP surgeries. You can go and work in specialities within medicine. And um, as far as I'm aware, that's a, a master's level uh, education. And then you go to university, do a, a master's, and then you can start applying for roles in advanced clinical practice. And that's it for me. Um, I hope I'll give you a good insight into uh, what an ODP does and the uh, career progression route. So I think it's important to know not only that your um, your role is within the theatre, but there are also roles outside of theatre as well to ex expand yourselves. And, and as a profession, we are constantly expanding. There's more people coming into the profession, our skills are being recognised more and more doors are opening for us. If you've got any questions, just pop them in the chat box and I'll try and answer them for you. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand over to Rachel to speak about dietetics. Brilliant. Thanks, David. That was a really insightful um, whistle-stop tour of being an ODP. Brilliant. Um, so now I'm going to um, start talking about um, how I got into dietetics, I guess, just to give you a flavour of um, the types of settings you can work in, um, some of the cases that I've seen along the way that I think have inspired me. So I'm Rachel and I'm a professional lead for dietetics across the acute and community in Cornwall. And I'm also a children's or a paediatric dietitian. So clinically, that means I'm in a really privileged position as I get to work with children and their families. Um, I thought I'd start rather bravely maybe with a poll um, and so I'm going to try and put that live now so hopefully you can all see a poll is anybody able to tell me if that's working or not um, rather optimistically trying to use Slido uh, David, are you able to um, help with that? I've got it says that it's um, that it's live. Yeah, so I've just clicked on pause, and unfortunately, there's nothing showing in there. 
Okay, well, that might have been overly optimistic. And I've obviously lined that up somewhere else in the background. If, oh, someone if, says, yes, um, the poll is working. So yeah, that's, if it's that's on good. Slido, it should work. Okay, cool. So, so um, I people just you... need to go onto the VHCC. So with, I'll put it in the thing here. So if you, if anyone wants to go onto Slido, um, and you put in the code VHCC twenty twenty, I'm about to put it in. You, or hashtag VHCC twenty twenty, and then select the session. So the session will be on Aspiring Hub One dietetics and ODP you should be able to access the poll so what I'll do is um, leave that running for a little bit and then um, come back to the results of that so um, how did I become a dietitian so I'd never heard of a dietitian before a dietetics it just I just never come across it. I was at college, didn't know what to do um, and decided that I didn't want to do medicine because I really value my sleep and did not want to do night shifts. Um, so that's where it came, that's what it came down to. So I went to uni and did biomedical science at um, Southampton. Um, I really, really loved the lectures in nutrition um, and I found out that you could actually have a career in nutrition by becoming a dietitian. So I got myself some work experience and that was it. I was hooked. So I did, um, after that uh, course, I did a year where I worked as a dietetic assistant, which was really great um, uh, experience and also allowed me to save up some money and go traveling for a bit. Um, and when I was away, I actually got some really tempting offices, offers to work in the Galapagos Islands and then um, in a ski chalet. But fortunately, I came back and picked up my studies and um, went to Cardiff, where I was lucky enough to do uh, dietetics as a postgrad. So there's a postgrad and an undergrad route. So if you've got um, a, a degree already in a relevant subject, you can actually do postgrad or master's route. Um, and that's much more condensed. Uh, so a quicker way to get your professional registration. Um, so I can't, I actually really recommend going to Cardiff. It's a really nice city. Um, you get to get involved with loads of the um, uh, clubs on site and also um, they, they also join in with the University of Cardiff. So you've got access to a whole range of um, clubs and, uh, and uh, all of that, that kind of excitement. It's really great to have access to as a student. As a student, I think it's um, really important to remember that you get a chance to work in loads of different settings and with lots of different specialties. So really do try to be open minded um, about where you'd like to specialise in the future and make the most of these opportunities. They'll set you up really well for your future career. So uh, once I qualified, I joined the HCPC register and got a job um, in Rotherham. Um, where we were the first dietetic team to hold the full budget um, and prescriber rights for nutrition related prescriptions. And so that includes things like tube feeds, um, nutritional supplements. Um, and that was a really, uh, really interesting experience. I got to work in people's homes, GP practices. And I also got to do some um, teaching in the Open College Network course um, as one of my seniors um, moved on. And so I got to backfill for her. And there we got to um, work and teach uh, community ambassadors who then took that evidence based um, positive nutrition messages out to their communities. So um, the way that you you can kind of um, get those messages further out there, was, it was really great to do that experience early on in my career. Next, I worked um, down in Nottinghamshire as a children's dietitian and seeing people with a whole range of, range of conditions. But there's one little boy that really stands out in my memory. Um, he only liked to eat and drink pink things. He was deficient in many things, particularly iron, and we really needed to work on expanding his food preferences. So I worked with his mum and his gran because um, he was very little. So he was he we we included him, but he uh, he was very quiet and subdued. Um, and uh, Probably with hindsight, that was a lot to do with his iron deficiency. Um, we um, worked on how to turn a wider range of healthier foods pink. So, for example, um, uh, we used tomato puree and cheese sauces and all of that sort of creativity actually worked. And so when I finished seeing him, he no longer needed a teaching assistant to mind him during his breaks as he was full of energy um, and he was out playing with his friends. 
Um, as a dietitian, you get to be creative, use your behaviour change skills, um, your science and food knowledge and combine them to help people to find ways that work for them. It's a really great feeling. Um, I then got a chance to move down to Cornwall, so I jumped at it. Um, and this took me on to an acute adult job covering a right, wide range of specialties. Hopefully, I can now see the results of the, of the Slido. Anyone able to help me there? Let's see. I've stopped the poll. So let's see if that gives me... Oh, view results. Ah, brilliant. Okay. So um, I don't know if you can see the results that I've got up here, but everybody thought that we as dietitians work with diabetes. 50% thought HIV, 15% in respiratory. Everybody rightly thought public health, allergy, gastro, paediatrics and sports. 50% thought industry, 100% thought weight management, 50% renal and 100% thought um, intensive care. and 50% thought frailty. So it was a bit of a trick question because it was all of those areas and actually a lot more. Uh, so in my job when I moved down to Cornwall, it was a really varied one. So I got to work in the same role. I got to cover things from stroke to surgery, elder care to gastro um, and got to pick up some more paediatrics because um, there was some long term sick in the in the um, in the team. So I think. My message is to you, um, to if there's an opportunity to kind of pick something up, just give it a go and uh, you'll be surprised at where it takes you. Uh, so after a couple of years, I was really lucky and got to set up a childhood obesity service for um, the early years. And that role opened loads of different doors. Um, and I became the children's lead and then the vice chair for the British Dietetic Association Obesity Group. And so through that, I got to do some really exciting things. So sat on an all party parliamentary group for a fit and healthy childhood, got to go and ha have high tea and join some debates in the House of Lords, um, publish research, go to international and present at international conferences. Um, and that was all because we were trying innovative approaches and getting such good results. Um, I also was really lucky and got to lead um, uh, with some others on a health promotion campaign um, called Junk Free Checkouts. And that resulted in um, many of the supermarkets removing unhealthy snacks from their checkout areas. And the reason I say that is because having a registration, like as, as a dietitian, you can do all sorts of things that you just um, wouldn't have thought of as your kind of traditional role. My role now is in um, leadership, and that's a really privileged position where I get to bring the best out of people to improve the care that we give to our communities. Um, and I also get to cover a very specialist area of dietetics. So I work with children with inherited metabolic disorders. Um, so that includes conditions such as um, phenyl ketourea or PKU. Untreated, um, this uh, a buildup of an amino acid called phenylalanine turns um, leads to brain damage, and that can cause severe learning disabilities and physical impairments too. Um, and thankfully, it can be treated through guess what diet. Um, it's a very complex diet where um, things containing sweeteners um, such as aspartamine or, or aspartame in particular, um, which is in most dr uh, sugar-free drinks, that needs to be avoided. And all protein must either be avoided or restricted. And then the person needs to take a special protein supplement, which contains all of the other essential amino acids. So I'm going to be brave and try and do a second poll. So hopefully you're all logged in now. Uh, if I can get it going. Um, so hopefully you can now see the next poll, which says which of these foods contain protein? So this time I'm going to give you a little bit less time because hopefully you're all there and able to see the poll. Can anyone confirm that they can see it? Um, OK, great. Somebody can see it. Fab. Um, just going to give it a second more and so I'm just going to close it there because um, uh, it's just oh so a few more votes coming in 
Okay, cool. So people have said which of the foods contain um, of these foods contain protein. So everyone said fish. Um, no votes for carrots. Half of you said Brussels sprouts. No votes for potatoes. Half of you said Weetabix. No votes for rice. Cream of tomato soup. Everyone thought that's got protein. Also eggs and milk. Marzipan and seeds got a 50% vote. Goji berries, the passion fruit and the figs, zero. So the reason I've put that poll up is just to kind of demonstrate how complicated um, this diet is and like how I think it's amazing that people follow it. Um, but they, because uh, in fact, all of these foods other than the carrots need to be restricted or avoided. Um, the fish, the seeds and the goji berries need to be avoided altogether. And the other foods, including the potatoes and the passion fruit, need to be eaten in very restricted amounts, which we call exchanges. So um, just to think about other routes, other things that you can do as a dietitian. So at the moment, I've actually taken on an additional role um, where I'm setting up the Allied Health Professions Faculty in Cornwall. Um, and that brings together people to look at things like expanding clinical placements, which is going to be really relevant for any of you that um, take on a healthcare related um, uh, course. Uh, and the reason I'm mentioning that is because I wanted to show you that, yeah, like I said, that a dietitian open up loads, being a dietitian opens up loads of opportunities for you. And you could go on and be the chief exec if, um, if you so desired. So I absolutely love my job. Um, and that's both being a dietitian and being part of the Allied Health Professions family. Um, and throughout the afternoon, hopefully you've got a flavour for the for, um, some of our uh, professions is actually we're a group of 14 uniquely skilled and complementary professions uh, that offer really great career options so please do go to the website such as I see the difference and that's got really useful uh, links to the health education England resources um, and it's then also in the British Dietetic Association um, websites which I've put down in the chat there um, which has got loads more information about coming along and joining us as a dietitian. I'm now going to um, hand over to uh, my colleague, um, I think Zoe, you were going to go next, weren't you? And uh, and she's going to tell you yes. about her journey, which is um, a completely different route from mine. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Yes, my name's Zoe Cottrell and I'm uh, working as a dietitian currently in Oxford. So I'm just going to take a few minutes um, just to tell you about my route into the profession and what I'm doing at the moment. Um, I actually, I studied at the uh, Surrey University many years ago, um, doing a four-year undergraduate course, so, so slightly different to, to Rachel's route in. Um, and this was at the point where you had in year three, you went out to do your placement um, which I spent at the Royal London Hospital. Um, actually, now at university, you do for dietetics, you have three placements. So you get to experience that hospital environment much earlier in the course, which I think is great. Um, but the course, which is still there at Surrey, it's one of the main ones. It's, it really is varied. And uh, apart from all the nutrition that you do, obviously, then there's modules in many other things, uh, such as pharmacology, clinical medicine, biochemistry. So it really is an interesting course. Um, but I then, um, my route in is quite unusual because after I'd finished university, I actually didn't go into dietetics straight away. I spent 10 years in the pharmaceutical industry in sales and marketing. Um, and after that, I set up my own business selling software back to the pharmaceutical industry. And that was for 15 years. So again, nothing to do with dietetics. However, um, once I'd sold that business, um, I really sat and had some time to think about what I wanted to do next. Um, the one thing that I just kept coming back to was dietetics, and it was just niggling me that I trained to do it. It was what I was passionate about, and I, hadn't, I still hadn't actually done it yet. So I started researching how I could get back into it after such a long time. Um, and I found out that if you haven't been practicing um, for two years or more, then you have to do a return to practice program. And that's the same for all the allied health professions, actually. 
Um, and obviously I had been out of practice for a lot longer than two years. So last year um, I finished my return to practice, practice program. And then I actually got a job here in Oxford as a band five dietitian, um, which is the band that you start on when you just, well, when people have usually just left university. Um, now this is a rotational position. So I started last September um, and I started in the community in Oxford. So working across the county of Oxford. Um, and here in Oxford, the, that role is split half and half into primary care. Um, so in primary care, you're seeing a wide variety of patients in clinics. Um, it may well be uh, irritable bowel syndrome. We, we see quite a lot of here. There's various allergies, such as cow's milk protein allergies in babies. Um, you may be seeing people with a very low BMI that need nutritional support, such as cancer patients. So these are all people in the community that you would see in clinics. Um, the other half of the time uh, in the community was spent doing um, home enteral feeding. So this is where patients, for one reason, can't fulfill their nutritional needs orally. So they have to have a tube which goes either directly into the stomach or into the jejunum, and they're fed that way. And, and I would visit them at home or in their care home or nursing homes once they come out of hospital and then on a regular basis. And these types of patients, um, you, you, the, there's quite a, a large cohort that are uh, motor neuron disease patients. Um, some are different types of head and neck cancer, which means that they can't um, eat orally. Um, and there's, there's also people that have had strokes and a variety of other reasons for whatever reasons that they need to be tube fed. So that was really interesting. And um, you're calculating their nutritional requirements that are specific for them and the disease that they have. And then you're working out their feeding regime to work out what needs to go in the tube for them and then monitoring them on a regular basis. So that's that's been brilliant to do both primary care and enteral feeding in the community. I actually just finished um, that role yesterday. Um, so that was the end of my um, time in the community for now and I'm moving into the hospital on Monday so I move on to the acute side which I'm really looking forward to um, at the John Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford and again the variety um, of specialities as Rachel said is just amazing and I think it's something that people don't really think about with dietetics um, so I offered a choice of different specialities to upskill in um, as a band five dietitian, you're, I'll be covering the general wards uh, in the hospital, but then you, there's different specialities. So there's um, ICU, oncology, um, gastro surgery, there's renal dietetics, pediatrics, as Rachel was talking about, diabetes. So many different specialities. Um, and I've picked to go into the uh, to upskill in gastroenterology, which will be really interesting. Things like Crohn's, diverticular disease. Um, so, yeah, I'm really keen to get started on that on Monday. So that's just a, a, a brief snapshot of how I got into the role. Um, and I must say, out of all the careers I've had, this is definitely the most rewarding one. And I'm really pleased that I decided to come back into it. OK, so thank you. And I'll now hand over to the last dietitian speaker, Anne Johnson. Thank you. Thanks, Zoe. Um, can everybody hear me OK? I just want to check because I can't see my microphone. Um, I'm very conscious of time, so um, I have a lot more to add to what those two lovely ladies have said. Um, just to tell you a little bit about my journey in, which was similar to Zoe's, but not quite the same. I left uh, school at 16 because I didn't want to do any more studying. I thought the world of work was much more glamorous. And um, so I didn't get any A-levels. I did a few jobs that um, I wasn't particularly interested in um, and then decided I would retire at 19 and then found out that that didn't pay very well. And um, so I needed to do something. So um, at the age of 25, um, I went back to what was the University of London then, which is now London Met. Um, and I did um, a science-based foundation course 
um, which was a year long, which took me on to the main four year degree as it was then. So I actually spent five years at university. Um, since that time, I went straight into the uh, acute setting and did a range of uh, short term contracts all around the country. Um, and then I decided that I didn't want to do that anymore. So I moved into the community um, and that's where I've been ever since. And um, most of my work has been based around health promotion, public health. Um, and I used to do things like cooking clubs um, and supermarket tours. So basically I used to get paid for making pizza and going to the supermarket, which I thought was a pretty good way to spend my time. Um, and then that led me on to other things. I, I've gone into a management role and following that, I spent um, a year uh, doing a fantastic um, uh, Allied Health Professionals Leadership uh, Fellowship, uh, which was a secondment from my um, role, which has led me into other things. Um, and as Rachel said, you know, um, dietetics is a fantastic springboard um, to lots of other things. And I've now kind of hopped sideways into a, into a sort of a physio sort of role in that I now work a little bit for Public Health England as a physical activity uh, clinical champion, so spreading the word about physical activity. And so I guess my um, my key take home messages are, it's never too late to, to, to re-study, re, um, to go back and do something that you're really passionate about. Um, any eyed health profession is a, is a brilliant springboard into lots of other things in the health service. Um, and for those that doubt it, community dietetics or community work is as rewarding as any hospital specialism. Um, and with that, I think I'll probably move on and give you some time to ask questions. So has anybody got any questions that they would like to, um, or has David, have you picked any up as we've gone through the session? Um, doo -doo -doo. If I was to take A levels, which ones would I need to, would, uh, which ones would be suitable for dietetics? So, um, so I did biology, um, chemistry, and I think you have to have both of those to go in, um, to go in direct in entry. I also did maths and geography, and then whatever the, the one that, general studies, that's it. <laughs> um, I think it's that the chemistry and the biology are the essential ones. Uh, if you haven't taken those already, um, you can then do the access course. Um, so don't be put off by that. I, some allow biology or chemistry and not both. Oh, excellent. Well, then um, I think the, 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 the more of the story is there. If you have go on um, to the British Dietetic Association website, uh, which I popped up in the chat earlier, it actually has information about access um, and which universities are currently providing the course. And maths is always very useful because as dietitians, we have to calculate things. So um, it's really helpful to, to have a to be very confident with your maths. I know when I did my foundation degree, I was very much, you had to do a maths module and I did chemistry and biology on top of that. So. Uh, I'm about to start my A-levels, but not chemistry. Do you think that's okay? I think that that is okay. But if you just double check in the, um, in the on the British Dietetic Association website, it might be that you can pick up an AS level um, in the second year in chemistry and just do like the first one year of it. Um, uh, because chemistry is very useful, um, but um, yeah, I, I think that the biology is the key one. And my route was a bit unorthodox, so um, you don't necessarily have to do what I did. Uh, what is it like to work with um, eating disorders patients as a dietitian? Um, Anne or Zoe, have you specifically worked in eating disorders? I've not specifically worked in eating disorders, but I know um, uh, it is definitely a specialty and you tend to be an, an, an part of um, a multidisciplinary team. Um, it's much more a sort of a mental health based approach rather than a, a, a pure community um, team. Um, so 
you, you have to work very closely together with consultants and psychologists and people like that. But yes, dietitians do work with eating disorders. Yeah, we've got a really fantastic eating disorders team. Um, and um, the I think that the way that they work in such a multidisciplinary way, such a team approach, um, it, it the, the kind of core bits there are to realise how important your behaviour change skills are as a dietitian. Um, and that's really key, actually, in whichever specialty you're in. Um, but with eating disorders, you kind of focus more on the diet part and um, really work in a, in a collaborative way with um, your psych psychology kind of counterparts. Um, but if you're really interested in that area in particular, then when you're as a student, um, I recommend uh, saying to the placement that you're going to that that's something you'd really get, like to get some experience in. And so even if you only get a few days there, then um, uh, as I said before, it's really worth trying to make the most of your student placements. Uh, can dietitians work in sports and industry? Yes, very much so. So you can be sports dietitian. So I used to um, know a dietitian who worked with the um, British Olymp Olympic team. So she went out to um, wherever the Olympics was being held. And um, uh, also my um, brother-in-law, he's an Olympic sailor. And so he had a specialist dietitian working with him, optimising things for every type of race endurance fast um twitch and in industry there's loads of different places to work so you might be working i don't know with um, a provider for school meals or uh, marks and spencers deliver um designing food different food um you could be working uh as a um in uh, the media so lots of dietitians work um, with right, like as journalists um, and doing TV programs, that sort of stuff. ODPs in intensive care sounds like exciting. What do they do? Over to you, David. I'll pick on that one. Uh, <clears throat> so I've got no personal experience of working in intensive care. Um, as the COVID pandemic hit, uh, as a student, we were withdrawn from placement. For, David, I think for... you're on mute. Maybe. Oh, I can hear him. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. So yeah, um, so I've got no personal experience, but uh, my understanding is that ODPs work in or have worked on intensive care um, in a specialist airway management role. So um, helping intubate patients, extubate patients when they need to be extubated, which means um, intubation means to be able to breathe for somebody using a machine, and extubation is removing that mechanical ventilation away from them. Um, and then they also monitor the patients. So whilst they are intubated, they look after, uh, check their physio physiological parameters and just make sure that they're at an acceptable level and then possibly make any interventions or escalate uh, any concerns they've got to the appropriate person to make any um, interventions that are needed. Um, there's a follow on question there. Do you ask yeah. me? quite technical and, and strong for your job. Um, no, there are a lot of women. I think there are um, more women than men um, as um, ODPs, registered ODPs at the moment. Historically, I think, you know, when when you look back at the role and how it's developed, it was a male dominant role. However, as things have uh, moved on in time, um, it, it's now a female dominant role, um, as I'm led to believe with the HCPC statistics. Which is good. Uh, no, you don't, and you don't need to be very strong. It's teamwork. So everybody chips in when you're moving patients from trolley to operating table and back and other things like that. Um, and quite technical. You just need to be um, aware of the patient's uh, current state and you know make use your training and your judgment to make any interventions that you need to make or escalate them. And there was one further up. Do ODPs and dietitians work in the army? Um, yes, they do work in the army, navy, and air force. I actually was in the army, but um, I wasn't an ODP then. I was a royal engineer, and then since I've left, I've retrained, and, and I was in our university doing ODP. So, um, do dietitians have any role in, within the military? Yep. So yes, you can be um, a dietitian um, in any of the forces. Um, and I, as I believe, uh, as I understand it, I think the forces will actually sponsor you through as well. So that's an, um, 
an interesting route. It's also worth knowing that for a lot of the allied health professions, there's also um, a bursary funding now. Um, so I think to get more information about that, there's a, a link that I put up a little bit higher. And I think you can get it through the IC The Difference website as well. Um, somebody's asked about work experience, and I think that's um, relevant to all of us. Um, so in our local trust, or for, for the courses as I understand it, definitely for dietetics, and I imagine it's the same for the other allied health professions, some work experience is actually mandatory to be able to apply. Um, and that work experience might take on all sorts of different forms. And it might be virtual work experience now, so do be open to that. Um, and there are some really great um, insights through the virtual reality um, videos that are on the I See the Difference website. And I've included up further um, the one for dietetics. And I would also say, don't get too stressed out if when you apply to, say, your local hospital and they say, oh, we, we sorry, we can't take you. They may offer you um, a sort of a, yeah. a taste a day where lots of people come at the same time and you get to see a bit of everything because they tend to get inundated with requests. So it's not always possible to take people on a system. And most trusts have a work experience um, department. So if you get hold of them, you can fill out all the paperwork and that means that you're in a really um, great position for uh, get ready to be able to um, take on any work experience that you do get offered. There we go. In the chat box there, there's experience. So thanks for sharing that, MC. Um, I think that's our time slot up. So um, thank you ever so much for coming to our chat. And I hope that you've enjoyed learning a little bit more about um, uh, the, being an ODP and being a dietitian. And please do come and train and work with us.